Well, it's February 1st, so welcome to the February 2023 edition of Michigan Gardener. So, what you see here, these are peppers, okay? These are cherry peppers. You can make some really good dishes with that, Italian food. And these are feta stuffed cherry peppers. So, I like those. And these are chipotle peppers. Now, what a chipotle pepper is, is it's a red jalapeno, or a jalapeno that you grow until it's red. Then you smoke it, uh, and then what you do is you pack it into this red sauce called adobo sauce, which is basically dried chilies, some spices, uh, and such like this, and then you can it. And chipotles are great in a bunch of different uh, types of Mexican food. You've probably eaten at Chipotle burrito, and that's the one of the components of the marinade that they put on their uh, chicken. In order to get those, you have to grow jalapenos, and you have to let them turn red. So these are the jalapenos I grew last year. Uh, they were pretty good, but I want to try a new kind this year. This is called Seed Savers jalapeno traveler strain and it's a well-traveled pepper so it says uh, seed savers exchange member larry pierce of carbool missouri has a sense of humor this variety was named traveler because larry carried the jalapeno with him when he moved to oklahoma wyoming and then missouri um, it's one of the best sellers for them so in order to plant peppers you got to start them kind of early because it takes at least a month for a lot of these uh, varieties to germinate and you need a heat mat that's what this is um, because they need to be oh between 75 and 85 degrees soil temperature in order to um, get started so what i've got here is just uh, two little trays with what's called seeding, seedling compost. And seedling compost doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it, um, but it's sterile, so you're not gonna get weeds and things like that. And the plants, when they're seeds and seedlings, um, really don't need that much nutrients because the nutrients are in the seed. So what I've done is I've made uh, some holes about a quarter inch deep. We're gonna bust into these, and I'm gonna plant a dozen, expecting to get maybe eight out of there, and eight plants should be uh, plenty for my chipotle needs for the year. So I mentioned I like cherry peppers, and I got some uh, cherry pepper seeds. Large hot cherry. <laughs> Capsicum annuum, so it's gonna be more this size. Uh, and these ones, likewise, you plant quarter inch deep seedling compost. So we'll pop those in. The next pepper I'm gonna plant is Aleppo pepper. And I got these seeds from Sherwood Seeds. Um, I've bought a lot of my pepper seeds from them and they usually have a pretty good germination rate. So Aleppo pepper, um, comes from that Aleppo, Aleppo, Syria. Um, but it's spread kind of throughout the Middle East and Mediterranean region. Uh, and it, what, it, what it is is basically chili peppers that they let ripen into kind of a dark burgundy color and then they dry them and then take the seeds out and then de uh, grind them up. It's like pepper, but it's uh, a little different. And it, it has kind of a little bit of a smoky smell, um, but it has the, the taste of uh, citrus and some other things in there. So it makes for a really good, um, you know, sprinkle over the top of salads or whatever you happen to be eating if you want to add a little zest to it. The uh, Scoville rating on a, the typical Aleppo pepper is about 10,000, which isn't, which isn't all that much. Um, but I'm told that in Turkey, the three most popular condiments in this order are salt, black pepper, and Aleppo pepper. I have two final chilies that I'm going to be planting this year. One is uh, New Mexico chilies. Um, 
hatch. Um, and the other is a chili called Mirasol. Now last year, with my hatch, I planted, uh, I didn't know there were hot and mild varieties of them. I, the only ones I'd ever seen in the store were like mild to medium. But I ended up planting the hot ones. And that's good for me, it wasn't terrible hot, it wasn't even close to what a jalapeno would be, but uh, not everybody has the same tolerance for you know, hot food that I do. So this year I bought from the same company, uh, Peppers of the World, Sandia Seed. Uh, I bought the mild variety. And um, technically, they're just New Mexico chilies. Um, I don't know why they're saying hatch um, because it's only a hatch chili if it's grown in hatch um, and this isn't hatch. The other chili I mentioned is Mirasol, M-I-R-A-S-O-L and I bought these from Refining Fire Chilies. It's uh, www.superhotchilies.com. Anyway, uh, the reason I bought these is because the Slopper Burger. Uh, so in Pueblo, Colorado, there's a regional burger called a Slopper that's, you know, the bun, open face, burger, burger, and then they dump uh, green chili over it. And the green chili that they are using is not a New Mexico chili, it's a Mirasol chili. And they're pretty similar, except that the Mirasols don't hang down and point at the ground. They go up and point at the sun, hence the name. Uh, and they have a slightly different flavor. And so, and you, you literally, I've never seen anything like this in the store here. So the stuff I can't get in the store is typically what I grow in the garden for peppers. So we'll get these planted, labeled, and onto the heat mat. Right, we're out in the red raspberries today and we need to prune these down. Um, the end of winter is the proper time to prune raspberries. There are two different kinds of red raspberries, those that bear fruit in the summer and those that bear fruit in the fall. These are fall bearing red raspberries and to prune them it's very simple. All you do is cut them to the ground. Now I'm going to continue through the entire row. You would of course always cut something that's completely dead all the way to the ground. As a little caveat, if you have fall bearing raspberries like these, after one year of growth, you can leave some of the canes and not prune them all the way to the ground. And then you will get a summer harvest from those canes that you've left a little bit longer and you'll extend your harvest season. So we're out here at the blueberry bushes. Blueberries need to be pruned at the end of winter. Um, blueberries form berries on newer growth, so you wanna take away anything that is dead, then anything that is crossing, and then ultimately because um, the buds and the fruit are formed at the ends of the stems, any um, modify, modification of the overall bush needs to be done toward the ground. So you're hearing a lot of noise in the background. We had that gigantic ice storm that came through um, this last week and our power has been out for five days. You hear generators in the distance. So here we have two sucker trees that need to be cut out. Um, these blueberries have not been pruned obviously for a few years and you want to kind of open up the center of the bush to create some airflow and ultimately you want to remove about a third of old canes so that new growth will be stimulated and that is where the majority of the berries will be produced. As another treat for the Michigan Gardener audience, I'm paying a visit to the Naples Botanical Gardens in Naples, Florida. This is just extraordinary. Um, another thing that they've done really, really well is that they label uh, most of the plants. Um, and they give you an idea of the country of origin. So 
those plants there are um, Ikmea and um, they're from Brazil. Um, you might notice some really giant lily pads out there with the edges turned up. Uh, I believe those are also Brazilian. Um, there are some that are even bigger than that. Um, I will try to confirm that. But just amazing. And the thing is, I'm at the same time of year as visiting the other gardens, and they've done a lot better job of staggering what's in flower, um, obviously throughout the year. There's still quite a bit of stuff in flower here. Um, the other thing is, is that just the way they've done it with the pathing and um, you know the borders and things it's much more organized at least in this part of the botanical gardens um, that's just amazing that water feature So I was right, um, those are actually from South America. Um, I, I'm almost positive they're also in Brazil. They're the uh, Santa Cruz water lily of Victoria. Um, and they have uh, spikes on the stems going up to there and spikes on the undersurface to prevent uh, predators. And at night, um, they'll send up a white flower that opens and they heat the flower to like 10 degrees hotter than usual and these scarab beetle things come in to pollinate and then when the sun comes up the white lily closes you can see one I think it's probably out there right in the center of the frame um, that might be the flower I haven't seen these flowering much there's one over there you can see for sure it's attached to the lily anyway it closes the beetles run around in there and then the next night uh, it reopens and the beetles can escape uh, really cool um, obviously I can't grow those <laughs> if you look on this tree here um, there are all sorts of plants growing on that um, those are like Spanish moss in that they're all epiphytes, meaning that uh, they don't need soil to grow and they can just attach to a tree and get the nutrients from around them. Some of those are orchids um, and you can see the level of detail that they've gone to to curate this garden. Over there you see some Spanish moss, that's also an epiphyte. Um, but if you look closely you can see that they've zip tied some of those um, epiphytes to this tree. Um, they've literally sculpted that. Um, just an incredible level of um, detail. Amazing. Here you can see a little bit more detail of how those uh, Santa Cruz water lilies grow. Out towards the edge, there and there, you can see some lily pads that have gone over. But if you look, all of these are connected to a central stem right there and this one is sending up those white flowers that we talked to from the central stem um, those ones haven't opened yet um, but they look like they will shortly i uh recognize this plant from when i was in haiti um, this is shiny leafed uh, wild coffee and it grows all over the mountains up there. Um, this is a little berry and the fruit around that is actually sweet and it surrounds a seed. Um, these aren't quite as big as the ones that I saw growing in Haiti but we would uh, collect the beans off the tree and then uh, take the fruit off and then roast the beans and man that was good coffee. This is called the water garden 
Um, it doesn't have the Victoria lilies, but look at how there's a defined edge and the water just drops off the face of the earth right there. Um, there must be a little waterfall down there that drains into the rest of the swamp. There's the uh, bird of paradise. I actually have one of these growing in my house, but uh, it's pretty rare for them to flower um, as an indoor outdoor plant. We'll see if ours ever does. Mine's at least that big. This is a uh, section of the garden uh, that features more uh, plants from Asia and some more Asian inspired water features and things like that. Really just getting into it now. That's a real classic thing that you see in Asian gardens with the archway to walk underneath. Um, here they have some vines growing up. Not 100% certain, oh, it's tropical clematis, that makes sense. Um, so you might remember that we planted two clematises on our uh, trees. It takes about three years for those to get established. Uh, and we're in our first year, so those won't be super impressive for a while yet. Um, I mean, just look at this. They got a little bridge here, a little waterfall there, a little seating area, a little island. Really, really well done. Um, I'm thinking of doing um, a, a pool like this and some archways like that, maybe not identical, um, but uh, with the idea of having a little seating area and then growing either wisteria or clematis or a combination thereof, um, just to uh, uh, spice up the backyard a bit. We'll see. I'd have to rent a backhoe to be able to do that. but. Coming to places like this definitely gives you a lot of uh, inspiration and food for thought. I wish I could see a small snake and maybe a small alligator, but I doubt it. Um, they have uh, a little succulent garden here. It's actually fairly impressive that they're able to do this um, where we are, given the nature of southern Florida and the weather. Um, but you can see that they've, they've put in these beds of really, really sandy and rocky soil. Um, grit. Mountains and seas of grit. I love it. But uh, just, and the uh, Florida Botanical Gardens had a succulent section that really wasn't worth filming um, because it was maybe... A, a tenth the size of this um, but this one's really really good check that out eastern africa to saudi arabia desert rose and it's in flower we've got a bunch of those madagascar palm can't say i've ever seen one of those but similar things like that grow in peru um, there's a species down there that's known locally as the blackthorn palm. I had the misfortune of brushing up against one of those one time. And it's not that you get stuck by the needles. It's that those needles are like really, really fragile. So they stick you and uh, <laughs> they break off and crumble. And then you got to dig it out of there. And... Uh, that was not extremely pleasant because as you're digging it out, it also breaks apart. And if you don't get that out of there, you're going to get sick. Um, idea garden. Very cool. You can see these uh, royal palms here. Uh, and my wife and I always joke and say that uh, they've had a good shave. <laughs> And that's because they don't typically have smooth trunks like that. Um, usually they're a lot more scraggly um, because as those leaves die off, what happens is they form like a scruff on the trunk. Uh, we saw 
uh, quite a few examples of that in, uh, well, there's some right over there. If you look right in the center, you can see the palm that, those leaves just kind of form a, a, a thatch work up the trunk. And in order for them to look, you know, manicured like that, somebody actually has to come by and do that and uh, peel all of that uh, old leaf stuff off the trunk. So these ones have had a shave. Here's a area where they've left it uh, quite a bit more natural. There's a trail that runs a mile around all of this. Uh, if you look in the center there, you can see some nice birdies perched on that downed tree. I believe those are cormorants, um, but I'm not 100% positive. Um, nice birdie. Uh, wow. This is uh, extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, I use that word a lot, but this is literally of all the gardens I've ever visited has the most attention to detail. It's the best maintained. It has the most information for you. And it has the coolest water features. I'm sorry, it just does. Um, multiple little things. I'm gonna see what's on top of there, but this runs out into that. So they um, set it up as kind of a natural waterfall thing, although in this part of the state, they just, just aren't pretty flat. Like, so obviously this is not official, but it's still really cool. This is the top where that waterfall originates, uh, draining down into that nice lake there. Uh, wow, wouldn't it be great to have something like this? This area is naturally a little bit higher than the surrounding areas, so somebody really planned um, all of this out really well. This here is a tree that I first saw in Key Largo. I've been wanting to see one, but I think we're too far north unless they must be specifically growing it. This is called uh, wild cinnamon bark. Um, it's not like a true cinnamon, but you get the hint if you take a little bark, and I don't want to because I don't want it to face their tree. Um, but it does smell like cinnamon, and that's native to um, southern Florida. Here's an example of how, um, even though I can't grow this kind of stuff in Michigan, I can still come to a place like this and take some inspiration on garden design. So here we've got some paths going different ways. And right in the center to kind of break up that path, they have this island uh, with, a, with a showpiece tree growing out of the center of it and some ground cover. Well, you know, if I'm going to be putting in uh, a water feature, I'm going to have to find something to do with all of the dirt. And um, one thing I could do is uh, build a little island feature like this up somewhere uh, in in the in the way of a path. Put some ground cover on, uh, and then uh, plant a showy tree in the center or something like that. Now obviously I'm not going to be able to plant a, <laughs> a uh, baobab tree because that's from Africa, um, but I could come up with something I'm sure. Here's something else to consider. I may not um, be able to grow a big hedge mage, a big hedge maze. But look at this. This is a labyrinth they've done with uh, paving stones. <laughs> That's like got to be one of the most clever things that I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> I'm sorry about the wind. Here's one of the neat things about bamboo. 
it's in the wind, you can hear crackling. I have to say, of all the botanical gardens I've visited in Florida, I'm going to give you a rating. Uh, I'll start with my least favorite, but was still really good, and that's the Florida Botanical Gardens. And one of the main reasons that one is good is because uh, it's close to the Columbia. <laughs> uh, second would be Mary Selby and I liked that one because they were more interested less in these formal garden type settings and their goal was to kind of preserve natural habitat that you'd fly, find in Florida um, but they spent a significant amount of time curating it so that um, uh, you could actually tell individual plants apart and you know there weren't a bunch of blown down trees and things like that um, so that you could appreciate it uh, as a stylized version I guess of uh, natural southwest Florida and by far my favorite is this um, place here the Naples Botanical Garden and that's why I left it for last uh, it's just amazing. I'd come back a thousand times because every time you come, there's going to be something else that's um, in bloom or something else that you haven't seen. Like all of these epiphytes, um, they bloom at different times. Uh, different times of year, it's going to be totally different. And uh, and you could you could explore this place and never see everything and never see every plant and it's at its best uh, or even close to its best um, so I would definitely come back to this place so I hope you've gotten something out of it I sure have um, and uh, that's it for my Florida Botanical Centers tour